chapter 11. We'll back up and get what we didn't get last week. So while you're turning, Children's Church, age 4 through grade 2. Age 4 through grade 2. They can be excused at this time. Some of them are already excused and back there, but the rest of you can go now. Okay. Got a little echo in my mic there this morning. Guys, if you can take care of that in the back, if you can't, that'll be all right. I was the echo for the whole time. Second, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1 through 16. This is an interesting passage of Scripture. We skipped over it last week because of communion, so we're going back uh, and picking it up this morning. And uh, it, uh, it absolutely has nothing to do with what you think it does. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. Uh, I can give you the message in, uh, in four points, and then you can go sleep. But uh, I'm going to go through it anyhow. Uh, first of all, who we are. This is who we are. Secondly, this is what we do. Thirdly, this is what it shows when we do what we do, because of who we are. Uh -huh. And then finally, this is why we do it. And that's what this passage of Scripture is about. And it's been so misunderstood and misused by so many people. And <clears throat> there are so many different applications to the Word of God anyhow. God always has a lot to say when when he says something, and if I get a text during the sermon, it's pretty important because, well, thank you, brother. I appreciate that. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, now I got off track then. Uh, yeah. Uh, this is what, I had to check to see what it was. One of the pastor friends that uh, has been praying for me for years, and every Sunday morning he texts me about 6 o'clock, and he says, I'm praying for you today, brother. And uh, then I always text him back and say, thank you, praying for you, Brother Warren. And, and I haven't heard from him this morning, so I text him about 5 or 10 after 6 and told him I was praying for him, and he just now texted me back. So he must be sick. And by the way, Sam's not here. Did you ever find out anything, Miss Norman? Okay, so uh, they, Sam usually comes at 7 o'clock on Sunday morning to pray with me uh, in the building here, but he wasn't here this morning, and he wasn't in Sunday school. So you remember him and Mary, something's going on with him probably... Uh, his uncle, we imagine, but we don't know. So be in prayer for him to stay in touch with him today. Uh, back to the order. Let's just get let's just get right into the message. Uh, back to the order uh, that uh, we need. Uh, and, and what Paul did, when Paul had to correct uh, someone for something, you'd always start off like you're supposed to start off, by saying something complimentary to start with. Even if there's nothing to say complimentary, make up something. You know, it helps people to where they'll receive uh, your constructive criticism or your advice much better. So you remember last week when he started in verse 17, he said, Now this, now this I declare unto you, I praise you not. I have no praise for you. But ye come together not for the better, but for the worst. I mean, you remember last Sunday, he just really nailed their eyes to the wall because of their selfishness, is what it was, and their self centeredness. But he started off that particular part of his letter by saying in verse 1, uh, or verse 2, of chapter 11, now I praise you. So he did it right. He started off with praise, but we skipped the praise part and we went right into the uh, negative part last Sunday when he got ready for the <laughs> communion. So we're back to the order as it should be. First praise and then correction uh, in uh, verse 17. Uh, God cares about, and, and there's several little things about the message this morning. All of you listen to me now. Don't go to sleep yet. God cares about, and somebody said, when they read this best scripture, does, does God really care how long my hair is and what I wear? Yes. He counts the number of hairs on your head, so why would he not care how long they are? Okay, he cares how long your he cares how long your hair is and he cares how long your dress is. And he cares about what's on top of your head and what's not on your head. My time there's nothing on my head now, but so I'm really in the glory of God. Because uh, it's in him and spot so the head's covered, so mine's completely uncovered. So we're, we're in good shape. But God cares. He spared, you see, he, he, someone has said he attends every sparrow's funeral. That's right. Okay? If he cares about the sparrow, and he counts the number of hairs on your head, he cares about your hair and your clothes. And that's what this passage of Scripture is about this morning. It's not about the things that some people think that it's about. And it's about those things that you don't think it's about, because you do think it's about too. Scripture is deep, and it has multiple meanings. When God speaks... We can't comprehend everything that it means when he says something. 
if you don't think that's true, if you don't think that's true, just read the ninth chapter of the book of John. And he goes, and he says three or four different things in different contexts in response to questions. It has nothing to do with the question that was asked, but it has everything to do with the question that was asked. But it goes about three levels deeper than what they asked, way beyond what they understood him to understand. Yeah. Did you understand? No. None of us can comprehend the mind of God. Right. But read that chapter sometime. If you get bored this morning reading while I'm preaching, it'll be all right. It's a good chapter. <laughs> but God cares about those things. Here, here was the problem. The local church, this is the problem. The local church there in Corinth was the only fellowship in the Roman Empire that would welcome all people, regardless of nationality, social status, sex, or economy, economic position, or any other thing, bond or free. The church welcomed everybody. Is it the same today? Yeah. It should be, and they welcomed everybody. And, and you see, they were not accustomed to that being welcomed together. And so they had taken the liberty, they had taken that freedom, and they were using it. Well, if I'm saved by grace through faith, I don't have to do anything. I can cut my hair as short as I want to. I can shave my head if I want to. Well, no, you can't, because in that day, the prostitutes cut their hair and shaved their heads. So, I mean, it was a sign. It was a symbol. You know, you have to... God cares about society and He cares about the norm of the day and He expects us to operate in a sense of decency in whatever society we're in, whatever it's got. You guys that have been overseas, you understand there's some things that we do in America that you just don't do over there. I mean, there's some countries that you go to that a husband and wife, if they walk down the street holding hands, oh my goodness, you'll get reprimanded or you'll get your hands smacked or you'll get shoved or hit. But two men walk down the street holding hands talking. I mean, two straight men, I'm telling you. They walk down the street holding the hand. Pastors in the country of Kenya, when I go to visit them over there some, at their home or something or other, I walk down the street with Patrick Walmala. He and I will hold hands. I was uncomfortable at first with him holding my hand, but uh, I got used to it because it's a custom. It's a culture. The pastors walk down the street holding hands together. You know, uh, and, and this is exactly what Paul's speaking about in this thing today. It's the custom of the day that dictated what Amen. Paul was saying. But the principles that surface are eternal. Right. So we want to go through the customs and then we want to get to the principles and we want to get them up so we can use them. The freedom was being taken too far by some. Uh, let, me, let me just real briefly, real quick, then I'll, then I'll get right into the thing and be through. But uh, uh, the, the, the temple... Uh, of Aphrodite was there. And uh, they had temple, oh, this is crude, you know, but they had uh, women there, and men, for that matter, and part of the worship service had to do with them doing what boys and girls do, supposed to be by themselves and not in church. Supposed to be husbands and wives. Kind of and, and so the ladies that worked in the temple as the virgin worship leaders, Sure, you can figure it out one time. They they shaved their heads to start. That's part of them going to work in the temple. Then after then after their service was over in the temple and they were no longer temple virgins, then they let their hair grow out a little bit and they were prostitutes on the street of court. I I don't know any nicer way to put it. So the problem was they never covered their heads. In fact, when they were getting ready to go to the temple, their heads were shaved, and then their hair began to grow out a little bit, and they just left their heads uncovered. In that day, in that day, a lady, a proper lady, never went out in public with her head uncovered. I'll tell you why. Just I'll go through that in a minute. Just what we're doing, why we do it, what it means, okay? When I get to those points and message. So that was the custom. So you understand the, the problem when some of the women decided, well, shoot far. Uh, I'm saved. It had nothing to do with where my head's covered or not. I think I'd go ahead I think I'd go to church get my head uncovered. It'd be like somebody coming in here with a something that was sexually seductive, a man or a woman, or whatever. It's it didn't fit well with the customs of the church. And you're gonna love the way Paul ended this up. I love the way Paul ended it. I love the way Paul ended it. Oh my goodness gracious. He did it well. He did it the way I would have done it if I had been there. 
The difference is, the difference is, there's a difference in men and women. And some people take, take this passage of Scripture and use it to make the man superior. That is not. Matter of fact, this passage of Scripture teaches just the opposite. It teaches the equality of men and women in the Lord. So it's a real interest. It's a wonderful passage of Scripture. I just, just love it to death. The principles, Paul's give, the principles that Paul is giving here are to establish authority in the church for the sake of order and to eliminate confusion in the church. So with that being said, let's look first at the practice. Now let's look first at who we are, verse 1. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Okay, we're all, we're all followers of Christ. That's why, see that, that has to, lots of people say that, that that does not fit in this verse of scripture, that it should have, uh, that it ties on to the end of the uh, previous chapter, and it should have been verse 34 instead of verse 1, and verse 2 of 11 should have been verse 1. But the truth is, it fits in both places very, very well. So Paul, as he begins to introduce <clears throat> what we do and why we do it, he says, be ye followers of me even as I also am of Christ. So the reason that we do the things that we do in church is because we're followers of Christ. That's our first motivation. Amen. I do the things that I do on Sunday morning because I'm a follower of Christ. And that's what the followers of Christ do in this age, in this society, in this denomination where I choose to be a part of. That's what they do. And that's why I do what I do on Sunday morning. And then doing my salvation, I'm already uh, saved, but this is the group that I've chosen to identify with, so I go along with the customs of this group that I've chosen to identify with, as long as it didn't contradict you to the Word of God. So let's look at the practice, verse 3 through 7. <clears throat> I've already talked about Paul praising him. So here we go. Here's the practice. But I would have you know <clears throat> that the head of that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman <clears throat> is the man, and the head of Christ is God. So you see the order there, okay? Every man praying <clears throat> or prophesying, <clears throat> having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered, dishonoreth her head, for that is even all one as if she were shaven, as if she had a shaved head and was in the temple. Same difference, he said, because it's saying the same thing and it's conveying the same message. That's the practice. The men were to stand speaking in the church uncovered. Why? Because the men were made in the image of God, as were the woman, but the men were made in the image of God, and they represent the Lord. They represent the authority. They represent the leader. They represent the head. They represent the one that's supposed to be willing to care for is made and die for that person. They represent Christ. So they stand in the church and prophesy with their heads uncovered because they represent Christ. That's a practice. The women are to stand if they stand. And by the way, just for your information, I want you to notice what it says there. But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth. He doesn't say there's anything wrong with a woman praying or prophesying in the church. It just says if they do. If they do stand and prophesy or pray in the church, then they're supposed to have their heads covered. They're not supposed to present themselves as a temple prostitute when they stand to preach and pray. That's what he's saying in everyday terms. Because that's what men saw when they saw a shaved-headed woman or a woman without a covering on her head in church. That's what went into their minds. Because why? That was the custom of the day. What does that mean? It shows, it shows respect and purity. Uncovered, uncovered women in the church with their heads uncovered meant that they wanted to be like a man. The feminist movement of what? The 90s, was it? When the late 80s, early 90s, the feminist movement got going ministry. Straight from hell. Straight from hell. Amen. Satan instigated it and he propagated it as long and as far as he could. And there's still some stupid people that follow it. It was a disgrace to be uncovered in that society today. The custom changes, but the principles are the same. Women are not to be like men. They're to be womanly. And, and a womanly woman is the sweetest and most beautiful thing in the world. 
But a manly woman is the sickest thing in the world. I saw a whole fill full of them yesterday. Maybe sick. By the way, it wasn't a group I was with. <laughs> Seek to see a manly woman or a womanly man. Woman is of such fine, it's a shame for them to want to try to take the place of the man and try to cover their power, their powers, their hair, their modesty. That's the power. And we'll talk more about that. Here's a side note. Women can pray and they can teach in church. So those of you that try to use this scripture out of Paul's writings, say I'm on the king. You're missing the token. Number two, the purpose. We just covered the practice. Here's the purpose. First of all, it's to show the order of creation. I want you to look at this. And this is where the tile came from. Which came first, the hen or the egg, the man or the woman? Okay. You say, ha, ha. Well, if we take a vote, everybody say the man came first, right? Well, what were you were born of? Mm -hmm. What was your mama? A man or a woman? <laughs> your mama was a woman. Your mama come before you did, didn't she? Well, it depends on where you start, doesn't it? Yeah. But let's see what God has to say about it. Verse 8, this is good. For the man is not of the woman. So the first purpose of the reason that a man looks like a man and a woman looks like a woman, and the man has his head uncovered because he represents the head, the authority, and the protector, and the woman has hers covered because she represents purity and holiness and loyalty and obedience. The purpose, first of all, is to show the order of creation. Look at verse 8 and 9. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Remember when God created the first woman? He took the rib out of a man and made her from that rib. So the woman's of the man to start with. That's, that's, that's interesting, isn't it? Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman was created for the man. Man was here man, doing around this, doing pretty good. But he didn't have a helpmate. So God created him one, so the woman was created for man. That's simply what he's showing is the order of creation. And for this cause, ought the woman to have power on her head or covering on her head because of the angels, because the angels watched. They knew what, they saw the creation. They saw what was going on. They knew what the purpose was and what the plan was. And, and, in, and in order to not disappoint the angels of the heavenly beings, then act like a woman. And men act like a man. There's other meanings to that because of the angels, but I won't address those this morning. Nevertheless, let's see. Let, let me leave that and go to verse 12. For as the woman... Now this is good. For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman. Your mama was a woman, right? Okay, that's the point. But all, but see what he said in the last three, four words. But but all things, God's five words. But all things, what? Of God. God's the author of it all, man. He's the one that made you. He needed you to get in your mother's womb, whether you're a man or a woman. Doesn't matter what you think you are, God needs you to get in the mother's room the way you are. And He made you what you are. You want to know? With that, as uh, Forrest Gump would say, that's all I'm going to say. About <laughs> Secondly, was to demonstrate submission to purpose. Look at verse 10. For this calls out the woman to have her power, have power on her head because of the angels, to demonstrate submission to God's purpose. God had a God created you women for the most beautiful, glorious purpose there is. And he's the one that created you. And he created men for a, a glorious purpose. So it's to demonstrate submission to the purpose. That's why a woman should have the glory, the power, her head covered. Submission, modesty, humility. And thirdly, to establish equality. All things are by God. Man's not to be domineering over the woman. A man that says he loves a woman enough and then he hurts her, abuses her, mistreats her, I'll be shot. Liar. Galatians 3 and 28, there's neither Jew. Matter of fact, in my family, if I was to mistreat my wife, her grandfather promised me that he'd kill me. That's pretty strong incentive, isn't it? That's why I let her beat me around, push me around like she did. I'm afraid to take my part. Y'all know what I'm saying? <laughs> Galatians 3 and 28, y'all are very familiar with this. There's neither Jew nor Greek, slave, there's neither slave nor free, there's neither male nor female. For y'all are one in Christ Jesus. We're all, we're all one in Christ. They need one. That's what we are. So here's the principle. Verses 13 and 15. This is real simple. 
He says, judging yourselves, is it comely or proper or appropriate that a woman pray unto God with her head uncovered? Now, why would he say that? Because the custom of the day. The custom of the day was a lady, a lady would have long hair and she would have her head covered. That was the custom of the day. So it's not appropriate. Judge it yourself. Is it? Because when you walk out on the street and a lady walks by, now church we used to pastor up there in Todd, some of you were up in Todd yesterday, that canoe place is out on, the, out on the other side of the church and people would go ride the canoe and then come walking in front of the church in, in little old string bikinis on. In front of the church on Sunday. No respect at all for the house of God or the property of God. Amazing. So you get through in church, you have just a wonderful spiritual service, and the pastor opens the door to stand out there and greet everybody, and you walk out, and the first thing you see is a naked woman. See what he's saying? You judge for yourself. Is it appropriate for a woman to have a head in Is it appropriate for a woman to dress like a prostitute? That's what he's, that's a question he's asking in today's terms. Pretty right. simple. Doth not even nature itself teach you that a man, that if a man have long hair, it's a shame to him? How many long headed men we got in here? We got a bunch of bald headed men. <laughs> <laughs> but if a woman have long hair, it's a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. It's amazing. Here's the principle, real simple. Men are to look like men. And women are to look like women. Right. Amen. I gotta say this. I shouldn't have done going to. It had nothing to do with scripture. It just hurts my nerve to see a bald headed man. that's still got a little hair on the side of his head. And he grows those few little hairs on the side of his head long enough to make him a ponytail. Really? Oh. <laughs> 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 and if I ever do that, have me committed. <laughs> Providing care, representing Christ. That's what we have in this Christ. Here's the proposition Paul makes to him as we finish this passage. We get, we're, we're, we're finishing up. Here's the proposition. I love the way Paul ended this. But if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. <laughs> Do you understand what Paul's saying? If any man seems to be, if you want to argue with me about that, if you want to dress like a, and you want to act like a, whatever, let me just tell you that the church has no custom like that. The church of God, the people that follow God, remember how he started off, be you follows me as I am a Christ. I just want you to know that in the church of God, that's not the custom. Amen. So what Paul's saying, if you want to argue or quarrel, I'm not going to accommodate you. I'm not even going to argue with you. Remind Amen. me of Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln said all our enemies want a racket. If I answer their accusations, they'll have one. If I don't, they don't. It's the truth. Matter of fact, there is no custom of women having uncovered heads in the church. That's what Paul said. I'm not going to argue. If you folks prefer these abnormal practices, in spite, um, this is my translation. If you folks prefer these abnormal practices, in spite of my reason, my common sense, and my arguments, then you stand alone against all that's done in the other Christian churches. If you want to be self, if you want to be self opinionated, peculiarism, Miss Folks, then just go ahead and hit yourself. I'm not even arguing with you. You see what credit he gave that kind of argument? Right. He said it's not even worth addressing. Right. I'm just going to let it go. So, in conclusion, then Miss Barbara comes and starts playing. Men's uncovered head spoke of lordship, godliness, Christ. In other words, purity, power, and responsibility. Men carry and dress and use yourselves like 
men that are godly and lordship in charge of the things that you're to be in charge of. And that you represent Christ to your family. You represent Christ to your family. So it speaks of purity and power and responsibility. Women's covered head or women's modesty represents the same thing. Purity, power, and responsibility, but it represents in addition humility and submission. An uncovered head in that society. And there are things today that speak the same way. Spoke of being visually and sexually attractive. And the women by that token of how they did their heads grow attention to their bodies and what they were offering to society. Here's the bottom line out of this passage of Scripture. Women, it's all right for you to teach. It's all right for you to pray in church based on this passage of Scripture. Just make sure that you're a lady and you look like and act like a lady when you're doing it. That's what he's talking about. Dress and act in such a way men so as to honor Christ in all you do. That's right. Father, in Jesus' name, your word is so practical sometimes it frightens us. As we read those ancient thousands of year old manuscripts and we realize just how relative and pertinent they are to us today. May we men in this church at Clear Creek be men of God that are faithful and loyal and protective and represent Christ with strong leadership in a good and godly way. And may the ladies of this church be ladies that are godly and good and responsible and modest and submissive, Lord, to the leadership. And may we realize, Lord, that you've created us all for, for a purpose and a plan. And, and you have a plan and a purpose for us, consequently. And may we fulfill that. And may we understand, Lord, that when you told the women to, if they had something to say to ask their husbands at home, you were speaking of when they disagree with the word of prophecy in the church. They're never to challenge the male leadership of the church. But when they get home to ask their husband about it, let him Help them understand. And if there's an issue, let him address it in the church. God, help us to respect your divine order and to be the men and women of God that you'd have us to be so you can use us. May we not do anything as an individual or as a church that would hinder your ability to bless and to use us. Father, speak to hearts today. Maybe there's a person here that's lost. It's not the person they ought to be in Christ. Never been born again, Father. I pray that today, even today, would be the day you've touched their heart with the word that's been spoken out of this very practical passage of Scripture on this <coughs> conduct and responsibility in the church to they have come to know Christ as their Savior. Maybe there's someone, God, that you've convicted of their manner of life or their dress. May you be the one that does that work in their life as well. Father, we love you. Praise you and thank you for your blessings. Please. Have your winter invitation today, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me, please? As Joe comes and leads us in our hymn of invitation.